Så här är också tanken då att jag börjar prata lite om vårt projekt och så presenterar jag mig väldigt kort och så satt och presenterar sig väldigt kort och så du väldigt kort. Och sen tänker jag att sen i slutet av vår presentation så kommer jag lämna över ordet till dig och då presenterar du Katarina och då kanske om du vill så kan du säga mer då om vad du också sysslar med det. Alltså sådär, men bara så att vi håller det kort där liksom. Right. Förstår du hur jag tänker? livesändning. Jag vet inte hur bra det hörs i mobilen. Ja. 
Ja, det är det. Okej, okay, välkomna everyone so much to this uh, kickoff uh, event for our new research project to which we have invited well-known artist uh, Katarina Firaksiku who is currently exhibited at Applaus Museum. Uh, we let it be a few minutes past time because we were still waiting for some people who you wanted to be here, but maybe they will drop in. Mm -hmm. uh, the language for this event is uh, English, but um, one can speak Swedish as well, so both languages go. Um, before we give the stage to Katarina, uh, we want to tell you all a little bit about who we are, who uh, have invited Katarina, and why we wanted to do that. Can everyone hear me good? Yes. Yeah, good, okay. So, uh, my name is Anne Sophie Lundgren, as uh, some of you know, and uh, I'm an associate professor in literature. I'm currently employed as a researcher at the Center for Gender Research and uh, the Department of Literature here at Uppsala University. And I'm specialized in canonized modern Nordic literature. Uh, and theoretically, I have an intersectional approach approach with particular interest in gender, sexuality, race, and species. Uh, and these are perspectives that are all employed in my most recent book, Following the Animal, in which I discuss power and agency in relation to human-animal transformations in uh, the works of some influential Nordic authors. And Sofie? Yes, would you like to Thank say you. a few words Thank about you. yourself? Yes, my name is uh, Sato Kuna. And, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's being filmed. It's okay. Okay. okay, yes. So my name is Sato Grunda and, and I work in, at the Hugo Valentin Center here and also at the uh, uh, Department of Modern Languages, I think it's in English, with the Henry Ugric Minority Languages. Uh, part-time. And I've been studying Nordic minority literatures and literature written in other languages in Sweden, so to speak. And this is uh, languages in, in, well, written in Sa Sami and Tornadalian Finnish or Mianchieri and also Finnish language. And then I have been working with other languages, uh, other, other literature as literature written by Roma and travelers. And uh, which was most interesting, mm. and also some other, so to speak, minority literatures, uh, and Kurdish literature, and so forth. But uh, for the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, working with this Sino-Yubic languages and minority literatures in these languages. I am an associate professor at Uppsala University, and I have also been working at uh, at uh, Sami University College in Kautokeino in Norway as a professor in uh, what is called professor in minority literature. I think this is a new trend in literary studies. I think now there's at least one person in the Nordic country has got a position as a professor in minority literature. I think this is something very new. <laughs> so, <laughs> It is a trend. Uh, minorities and the others are coming also as subjects uh, uh, at our universities. So, uh, and my interests include also revitalization of minority languages and cultures, um, and also language policy and how language policy affects uh, literary production in minority languages. So I think this is all. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. Okay. Would you like to say a few words about your 
research interests. Yeah. Oh, hi, I'm Maybe Thurman. I am PhD of History of Science and Technology from the Royal Institute of Technology, 2007, and I wrote my dissertation on hydropower in Tanzania. And uh, well, it's a socio-technical feminist post-colonial study of hydropower exploitations and Swedish development assistance. And uh, then I started studied my own part of the, on my own region, my own river, and started finding the similarities of treating uh, people when hydropower exploiting uh, the, rivers, the river valleys and rivers. And uh, from then on, I've been well, reconnecting with my Sami heritage um, and also going into de decolonization on my own my own region because I was I was and I never thought I would study my own region. I always wanted to go away from it. But studying Africa and Tanzania, I realized why because I was learned to I was brought grown I was brought up. Uh, rejecting my own history, or I was never taught my own history, actually, because Sami history is not part of, of education at all. And when my, uh, over the years I have been uh, uh, gradually l learning my own history at the same time as, as uh, lecturing about it and writing and researching. And uh, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> And so I'm um, working on uh, well, both. Uh, being also o opening up when I do when we were working on hydropower stations in in the Lule River Valley, which is my home river, uh, same as Catarina will speak later. I also realized uh, I, I got in touch with other exploitations, realizing you cannot only talk about one exploitation because you have all the others. And it, the mining came up, forestry. Well, everything that is impacting, uh, and polluting, and destroying, and uh, so over the years I've been uh, doing di within different research projects, uh, addressing these issues in, in with feminist technoscience and indigenous theory, methodology, decolonization, because it goes very much together. You cannot speak on the one without knowing and understanding the other and the history of colonialism and all. And uh, so I've been. Uh, I am at the Center for Gender Research, which is part of this node, and um, uh, I have also set up uh, Samiland Free University as a platform, for both for collaboration outside the university, but also for bringing in the Sami perspective, because there are no Sami perspectives in, in academia to this day. And I think, uh, well, I have, I have a lot of things, but you can look at my website, my, mybridoma.com, and I speak what I do, and the Samiland Free University website as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Let's go on and we will and get back uh, I just always say that I'm I'm live streaming and I just realized that the YouTube live stream is only taking three viewers at a time, so I have to change oh. into another one. So okay. bye bye YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The marvels of technology. Okay, so us three we have engaged in this research uh, project called uh, Science Validation Partial Perspectives, uh, Knowledge Production Beyond Norms, uh, or in Swedish, uh, Vetenskap Validering Partiella Perspektiv, Kunskapsproduktion Bortom Normerna, and this is a so-called research node here at Uppsala University. And it runs for three years, and it started the 1st of January now in 2016. Uh, and it is financed by the disappeared domain of humanities and social sciences, sciences here at Uppsala University and also by the Center for Gender Research and the Department of Literature and the Development Center, which is now a part of history, right? It's part of history. Yes, and we're still a center. We're still a center, okay. Yeah. What we take an interest in uh, in this uh, project is, as the name reveals, uh, the norms that govern uh, the academic production of knowledge. How do we generate knowledge in an academic context? Which norms are active? And what are the initial premises that we start from? What do we take for granted as central parts of our arguments? And what is neglected and thus rendered invisible? And how do all these questions correspond with issues regarding power, 
interpretive prerogatives and representation. Those are the uh, essential questions that we work with. <coughs> and um, our starting point uh, was really Donna Haraway's now classic article, Situated Knowledges, the science question in feminism and the privilege of partial perspective from 1988. And uh, in particular, we found uh, of, of this quote, which we think yeah, um, sums up very well what, uh, where we start from in this project. Uh, Haraway writes, the moral is simple, only partial perspective promises objective vision. All Western cultural narratives about objectivity are allegories of the ideologies governing the relations of what we call mind and body, distance and responsibility. Feminist objectivity is about limited location and situated knowledge, not about transcendence and splitting of subject and object. It allows us to become answerable for what we learn how to see. This is a rather often quoted passage of this uh, article, which we think is, uh, it sums up well um, what it is we, we think that we, we want to do. Uh, also, um, another thinker uh, that have provided us with guidelines for the work in this note uh, is Michel Foucault, who in 1975 wrote an essay called uh, Society Must Be Defended, that I guess you, know, you have read. And there he speaks about subjugated knowledges which, according to him, are a whole series of knowledges that have been disqualified as non-conceptual knowledges, as insufficiently elaborated knowledges, naive knowledges, hierarchically inferior knowledges, knowledges that are below the required level of erudition or scientific scientificity. <laughs> Hard work. Um, so, we want to do bad research. <laughs> In short. <laughs> and pick up all these. Or pick up what to discuss. What does this mean? Well, where do we start from? And uh, which utterance, <coughs> statements, act, and phenomena that move beyond the established systems of knowledge and therefore do not fit within the prevailing discourses are, uh, I mean, can also be found if you look at it from that perspective. Okay, so this is like our starting points, and then we have um, a few uh, categories and perspectives that we specifically focus on. And that is uh, sex, gender, and sexuality, in which we include sexual identity, queer theory, transgender uh, issues. Uh, ethnicity and race, which uh, include questions concerning culture, tradition, religion, and language. Uh, critical and qualitative indigenous perspectives, uh, more specifically Sami perspectives, but uh, any indigenous perspectives really. Uh, the question of place, what is central, what is peripheral. Uh, questions of social class. Functionality, which includes questions of body, age, health, and the human animal divide. And I will not speak for so much longer now, but uh, we have uh, taken these uh, categories and perspectives as our starting point when we uh, are trying to also work with another term by Haraway called otherworlding. Like, what if, if you can play the what if game, what if the modern Western two sex system is a historical construct? What if heterosexuality is an execution of power? What if the academic production of knowledge was not governed by post colonial power? What if our production of knowledge is mostly connected to the ontology of majority communities and languages? What if Sweden's first university had been founded in Jokmok instead of Uppsala? What measures had then been taken to ensure that the people in Stockholm and Uppsala would get representation and influence um, 
on the epistemological level. Uh, what if 20th century social movements had overthrown the middle class hegemony in academic education and installed the working class as the norm in academia? What if bodily and cognitive functionality was not a prerequisite for representation and inclusion in the epistemological processes in academia? What if anthropocentrism, with all its aspects, was not the taken for granted norm in the humanities? What if the alleged stability of the category of human itself was never more than an illusion? And what if ethics and responsibility were considered fundamental part, parts of all research processes? What if? What if? One can continue. Okay, uh, just a final, final word, this logotype that we're really proud of, that our uh, technical genius Maybrit has uh, <laughs> has uh, created, uh, I'm sure you know about word clouds where you can you put a text into a program and then it comes out as, as uh, a figure. And this is a word cloud that was created by, um, or was generated from this article by Donna Haraway, Situated Knowledge. So this is our logotype and uh, this is what you should look out for if you want to uh, keep on coming to our events. Uh, we will arrange um, seminars and we will also write for example applications and uh, if you're interested in getting information about what we continuously do uh, in this research node I ask you to write your name and address email address on this I will also send a flyer round so you can take a flyer and uh, see where you can go on the internet for example to find more information about us uh, and I can also just say that we have a special uh, focus or we will put special emphasis on working with master students and doctoral students. So we are more um, extra happy to include those categories. Uh, okay, so uh, that said, I will give the word to Maybrit who will introduce our uh, speaker today. Uh, right, Maybrit. Is that true? Okay, yes, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm working with the technology here. <laughs> If you want more information. Uh, this is what happens when you don't realize that you're in a university which has video conference rooms in advance, but we're learning because this is a, uh, we said it's a very new research project, and um, so we want to be, uh, how to say, make it uh, available for long distance throughout the whole world, but also for places like Jokmok, uh, the whole Sami territory, the northern territories of, of the colonial state of Sweden. Um, so, but next time I think we'll be in a video conference room. But this is also exciting to learn on the way. And with that I will go over, start with um, introducing Katarina. And I think I need to say that what I started to tell that I've been, when I learned about my own Sami history, uh, things happened. I was, uh, I was, um, I met a, someone who I, connect through the internet actually, um, a Sami woman who has been doing genealogy and we had con in contact on the internet so we, I asked about the name that I thought was noble name but she told me no it's a Sami name and so and then this was in like 2005, 2009 she asked me to come to a conference uh, or a, a Sami party uh, annual meeting and so we started talking and she asked me won't you wear a uh, Gatte, uh, this the Sami dress, and I said, well, it looks lovely, but I don't have the time or the, the patience to do anything like that, so I won't do it. Uh, but then she made one for me, and then I had to wear it. <laughs> and, uh, so this was, I think, first time I wore it was in 2011, and, and at this point, I think I was in, for some reason, somebody wanted to make an article about me, so I wore this, and I was interviewed in the Svenska Dagbladet, the newspaper, and so Katarina saw this one. And she wrote to me, and I wonder if this was 2011, 2012, yeah. Since then we've been in touch and, um, uh, and con conversing, and uh, I've realized the, w the work that Katarina has been doing is so uh, fantastic. It's, it's about the, the archives that are here at Uppsala University, the photographs, which I had heard of, uh, but I never, I was also 
by the professor Karin Johannesson, who has been working, also looking at, at them. I don't know if she's written anything about it, but she told me, well, if you go to these archives, you need to be prepared because it's heavy. It's really heavy. And then uh, at a later point, I went there with uh, Agneta, who made this for me, and it was heavy. And, <laughs> and we're talking to Katarina, so it's so great. You, you have been working with this for such a long time, and talking to you about it, it's like, I can relax. Uh, because it's, um, I, I have to say, there are, there are people who have been writing about this, and I don't know if they're, they are sa hidden Sami or non-Sami, but nobody has been open Sami writing about it and, and analyzing it. And I c I've seen there are seminars with people who are discussing the racial biology, but I don't go there because I'm not sure I will be safe <laughs> because they might be talking, showing a picture from my relatives. Uh, one of the first things that happened to me in 2008 when I started looking into my heritage, I found a picture of my ancestors on uh, the website of No Discamuseas, just like that. And I was like, wow, fantastic picture. But then uh, in the context described by the Nordic Museum, it's like they're victims that um, I'm, I'm made to feel sad for my own ancestors. And it's very, I say you, you become like split. You don't know what to think anymore. I'm, 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 I grew up learning to be Swedish. I'm strong and confident, and then like they throw things at me, and I don't know how to react. So the work of Katarina is like I would call it a, a, a it's, I'm sighing of relief when I, I met you and your work, and it's like well, it's a safe space for me uh, to to. I can relate to your work. I cannot l relate to the academic work written by people who write about the Sami as the others. But you write from the inside and make it uh, a, a process of healing at the same time as you, you, you display or what's going on. So it's, um, I'd say it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm formulating myself the words that I have not formulated. I have not described your work to anyone else before and I haven't written about it because it's, it's, it's hard for me to, but um, I, can, I can feel relaxed. And I, I, um, and I wrote, when I wrote the abstract uh, together with Katarina, the uh, thing is, what you do is research, uh, high level research in feminist uh, methodology and indigenous methodology together um, and doing it as artwork. And I was thinking coming here this morning, should I refer to you as professor? And I think, why should I even use the word a professor? That's the academic's colonial states, <laughs> no, like idea. So what is the best? But if it was in the in the Swedish academic or the Western academic, I would refer to you as Kata, uh, Professor Katarina Pirakziko. Uh, but I don't think it's necessary because we don't need that in the Samland Free University. We are the we are who we are. <laughs> And um, uh, with that, I would like to uh, leave the floor to you. I, um, I just want to um, make everybody understand how important your work is um, and realize that uh, what you've done is just, uh, and I know it's, you've done it most of it on your own, like money and time. And I had the opportunity to provide a very small grant of the, of the funding I had, but it was like not even one month's pay for the fantastic work of more than 10 years. So I really want people to understand the fantastic work that you have been doing and that in the Swedish academic system by now you should have been more than professor. <laughs> so with that I leave the floor to you, Katarina. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. You. the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you, Maybrit, for your words. She has also been important for me. Because when I, uh, when I wrote her one email, I was really alone. Then, ten years ago, I started, I was at the Art Academy in Umeå, 
and I had been working with the, my identity and I had been trying to be in different positions to, to try who am I as a person. And the last year my studio was empty and uh, one of the professors he came to my studio and we were supposed to have a talk and I had nothing there. And he said, Katarina, this is your last year. What are you going to do? And uh, I don't remember what I answered him, but he said, you know, art is going to hurt and you have to create something from yourself. So I, in my studio, it was a small studio, I did a small room. And I, I was drawing in this room and I was writing and I had photos and I was just taking from my past what, what, what's hurting. And uh, after this, I, my, this small room was, I had a lot of uh, works there. And I didn't know how to select all these art pieces from each other, what was my own private pain and what was the pain that I shared with other Samis. So I in invited eight persons, all women, and we are Sami. And uh, so we talked to each other one night and I had Pika. <laughs> we were sitting on the floor and we had fika. And then, three days later, a woman, she called me and she said, Oh, Katarina, you know, I met a man yesterday at the pub and he is working at the Forskningsarkivet. It's an archive in Umeå and he has found the instruments that the race biologist used. So I went there, and this is from this my first visit at the archive in Umeå. And we didn't know so much about these instruments. They didn't know who had given the, the instruments to the university. And it was uh, Manus, it was a script uh, from a dentist and I was looking and then I found a name. The name was Gustav Bergfors. And we could find that he had been up to the north Sweden 1923. And my uh, husband's father, he was measured 1923 in the north Sweden. So this instrument was even more, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like maybe the, uh, a race biologist used this instrument to measure my uh, father-in-law and I was trying on myself. And uh, after I had been to this archive and after I had done this measuring things, I was thinking, I have done what I can do with this, uh, with the race biologist. And I was done and the, at my exam, uh, a tutor, she told me, but do you know, you have you have found your thing, you can work for with this issue the whole life if you want. And I said, no. <laughs> but then, uh, I decided to go to Uppsala. Because I was thinking, because I really wanted to know, was it, we said, same as we are um, really good to fight, we love to be in dem demonstration, and. We are always angry. So I was going here with the, with the idea that someone had 
been written really angry letters to the, Ra the Institute of Race Biology. So I went here and I went to Carolina Redivira and I was reading all the letters and I couldn't find anything. I realized that Hermann Lundborg, who was the boss for the Institute, he had a lot of friends up in the north and I started to do a map from all the people that he knew and so on. So this one is my, I did this one when I was angry because I, I had been so angry with the, with the Institute of Race Biology and I have been looking for a lot of, uh, when I have been reading these letters, I have taken text from the letters and I was going just to make a museum of the Institute. A set, uh, and I wanted to have the perspective from this, a semi view of the Race Biology Institute. So, uh, so you are the first one who is seeing this map that I have done because uh, I haven't shown it because I think maybe now it's not necessary. And this, uh, I. This is Jokmok up here, and this is Uppsala. And I have moved from the opposite direction. The, when they went up to, the, when the race biologists went from Uppsala, they went by train to Murje. They took the bus from Murje to Jokmok, and I have done the same trip, but from Jokmok, Murje, and down here <coughs> to make a map of the institute. It was my idea from the beginning. And uh, I also went to look at all the photos, the archive, and um, because I wanted to talk with someone who had been measured by the race biologists. I have done it myself, I have tried it and so on, but it's not the same. I, I have done it myself. I was never forced to do it. So I, I wanted to talk with someone and uh, so I went, so I had decided to, uh, to ask for photos from Jan Samis from my area and uh, in these albums you can see that everyone they wear their traditional costume so it was easy for me to pick pe people she's having a traditional costume from my area and I went to a lot of all people in Jokmok and I was showing the pictures and we could find a few persons that we could say this is she or he or whatever, but everyone was dead. And this woman, she's, her name is Elsa. Elsa, she's an old friend, friend to my family. And she needed help because she had sold her house and she was going to move to an apartment in Jokmok and she had they were five brothers and sisters and all had died and she was alone so I helped her and during this time I asked her have you heard something about race biology and she said no and um, I was, she had heard about race biology because she had seen uh, a program in the television 15, 20 years ago. So she could say, yes, I have heard about it. And then one day, uh, I had taken a photo of a woman 
She's 50 years old. She's good looking. Her dress is not from my area. She's really proud. And I went to Elsa and I showed a picture for, of her and said, and Elsa, she said, but it my, it's my aunt. It's Aunt Faster Anna. And I knew Faster Anna because I had been working with Elsa with all her things, you know, five, four, two brothers and two sisters had left all the stuff to her. And so we had been looking for a lot of handy crafts that Faster Anna had made. And Elsa, she said, oh, but this picture, it's taken by uh, Anna Michelle. And Anna Michelle, she's, she was from Uppsala, she was race biologist, and she was, he, he, she was in my, at my school in Vaitkeo, and she came to my home in Utsja, and uh, she left without saying goodbye. She had a, a gray, uh, uh, like a skirt, trousers, and it was, uh, they were really nice, and she tried to sell them, and she was Anna Michelle, this woman, she, she was, she, uh, she made a kind of pepper pork food. Gingerbread? Yes, mm -hmm. gingerbread. And uh, my, so she knew this woman, and she, so she could tell me how it was to be measured. I don't know why she, why she said to me, in the beginning that she didn't know anything about race biology. And here, this picture is, um, we went to Vaitkeo, Vaitkeo is outside Jokmo, and uh, when Elsa was a child, she went to a school in Vaitkeo, it's called Nomadskola, and uh, when we were standing there, she said to me, and this is, uh, um, if I hadn't gone to Vaikjör with, with Elsa, she wouldn't have told me this. But she said, we were freezing when we had to take off our clothes and, the, and they took the, the picture of us when we were naked. I don't think she would have remembered this if we hadn't been to Vaikjö. And this is her uh, village, Ucha, it's called. And she drew this map to me to show me how it looked in, uh, in Ucha when Anna Michelle came to, to Ucha to measure the people. And Elsa, Elsa, she thinks, or she thought, it was a man who followed Anna Michelle to Ucha. And she thought it was a German uh, professor who came to, to Ucha. But I haven't, I have tried to find in the archive if I can see if someone followed Anna Michelle to to to, uh, to Ucha. What's really good with all these pictures and with the archive, with the written material, that I can follow the history. But you know, I take the the left. Uh, way to, to find the history of the Samis. I can, uh, <clears throat> so I have found the travel that Anna Michelle has got paid for, and I can see that she has been to Ucha, that Elsa has told me. So I can follow the history, but we take different paths. Mm -hmm. This is the woman that I told you. And she was one exception for my, my photos that I ordered from the archive. 
and I'm so happy because I found this woman and she it's sometimes it's like the people in these albums they are talking to me they want they are showing themselves in the albums and maybe she wanted to tell me the story or to help me so I have made a frame and the pattern around the picture is from her sleppa it's called in in Sami it's it's the my bitch is also wearing a sleppa it's <laughs> this one okay, it's sure. oh. <laughs> This one? No, yes. This, this part? Yes. Ah. It's a slip. And uh, uh, the, pop, the pattern that is around these photos is on the slip in uh, this family. And all the buttons, I have got them from uh, Aunt Anna before. I, I knew that Anna was in this picture because it it's a uh, pen. <laughs> and this piece that you have in color, it's from her traditional uh, costume that she was wearing at this moment. And then, uh, when I have been to, to the archive, I have, um, I haven't get, get paid for this work. I have tried to apply for money from many, many places, but I haven't been successful. But anyhow, so I, I had to live with my friends. And once I was here at the archive, and I was looking in the albums that with naked persons. And then I came to my, uh, to my friend. And in the kitchen window, I saw a photo. And I, when I saw it, I knew that I have seen this woman today naked in the, in the albums. And I asked my friend, who is she? And she said, oh, it's my grandmother. Uh, and I said, but uh, do you know where, where have you got the pictures from? And she told me, and she said, yes, it's from the, I know that my uh, uh, grandmother, she met the race biologist, uh, and it's uh, a photo from the album, but I had seen her naked also. And the all, Evening, I was seeing, you know, naked persons in every spot in her apartment. And it was really awful because I didn't want to tell my friend that, you know, I saw your grandmother naked in the, in the albums. Because I was really, when I had seen this album, I went from, the, from Carolina de Viva and I was sitting outside in the uh, Engelska Parken. And I, don't, I didn't know how to deal with it because it was, no, I didn't know. And uh, so I went to her and then to see this photo with, and with all these women that were standing in nine different positions. I don't know why they were standing like this. And uh, so I was, so this is one art piece that I really wanted to, to show that it was really, the history is still living, but we don't know it, but it's like it's going uh, beside ourselves. Mm. And then uh, uh, I felt that I had to de deal with this naked photographs. And uh, I didn't know how to do it and how to deal with it because it was really difficult. And uh, I decided to draw the people. 
So I asked at the archive if I could get one photo of a woman who was standing in these nine positions. I ordered it and they said no. You're not allowed to, to get these pictures, this picture. And I didn't really know what to do, and I was a little bit upset because I, I thought it was really important for my art piece to have this picture. And uh, a body, 100 years ago, it's a little bit different from our bodies because they have, they have been using their bodies in a different way. So you, you can see that the muscles are a little bit different from a body today because I have been drawing a lot of kiruki during my studies at the art academy and so on. Uh, but I didn't, and I was, I was writing a really angry letter to the university. I never sent it. <laughs> and, and then I was thinking, no, I, and then I went, I came to Uppsala again and they, and at the court, Bildenhet and they told me, do you know, we did wrong. You can have this photo if you want it because it's on the offentlighetsprincipen. I don't know the English name, uh, but I was allowed to have it. And in this, and then I didn't want to have it because I was thinking, why well, have a picture in my drawer, in my studio? And so I'm a little bit happy for the answer. So, but I have my own body. So I decided to use it. So I have a uh, so I, I have studied how they were standing. Uh, but I'm also a mother. I have two uh, young children or young youth. And uh, I was thinking maybe they don't want to see their mother naked in one <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> so I decided to, to make a drawing of myself. But I have made photos first. And it was my, my sister's daughter. She took them. And I said, but Cecilia, you have to remember I have a head and I have uh, feet. And you have to look that you have, you have me in the, in the picture. And she has cut all the feet in every <laughs> <laughs> And she said afterward, do you know, this, this was not nice to do. <laughs> and this. Uh, sentence, gotcha dit mannien, gok, ei me matte dit. It's Sammy. And no one, maybe someone, understands this. And I went to, when I was trying to find a person with the pictures, with the photos, you know, I went to a lot of all persons in Jokmo. I went to a woman, and I know that she was measured by the race biologists, but she's saying no. And then um, we were talking about it, and I asked, but did you ask why? And she got so angry. We are talking Swedish to each other, and she changed language, and she said to me, Katja dit mannen gok, ei me matte där and she said a lot of other things also in, in <laughs> Sami, but this was what, what really hooked me. And it's ask, ask why, how. We couldn't speak Swedish. So it was also a language problem. They couldn't understand each other. They had uh, translators in the beginning, but then the institute had less and less money, so they had to to have less and less people in the exhibition, uh, expeditions. And here you have some of the 
positions that they were they had to be standing in. I don't know why. And I all I have also followed the the travels that they made up in my area. I'm thinking maybe the nature can remember something and I also want to have color on this history because it's so easy to see. When you see all these uh, black and white photos, it's so easy to think it's not, it hasn't happened or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, ha I wanted to, to hide in their traces and to find the places where they have been. I have been in the area, but not maybe not in the in the places. And I have also shown the, the houses because I was uh, I was really alone when I was working with this. But then when I was at the archive, I met a woman, and she told me that it, it's one man here at the university had. He has been studying this this material so maybe you can write him and so I did and he said uh, and he wrote me it's a lot of myths, myths. myths about the race biologists they went up to the north of Sweden and they um, and they they had a camp and the Samis came to this camp and I got a little bit upset and I, I answered him uh, I don't know where you come where who you are where you come from what kind of studies you have and what kind of tools you are working with but I know who I am and I know that uh, the the race biologists, they went to Laimolahti, to Saltolotta, to Ucha, and I was, um, because I know where they have, have been, and I said, and I know that they haven't been, uh, they haven't been on a camp, they went to, to places their people are living, they are still living there, and they have been living there for many, many, many of years, and, uh, Maybe he thought maybe they went out just in the to the mountains just to to a place that people didn't live so and then we stopped writing to each other. <laughs> <laughs> he never asked me, but uh, so I this this art piece uh, it's a little bit. I have made it for him to show him <laughs> that this is places that people are living, especially these two pictures, to show him that this is a living place. Oi. Something has happened here. And this photo I have taken because in the beginning when I saw all the pictures in these albums, they have all always a white background. And I was thinking maybe the photo was taken at one institution. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. But when I have been reading all this text, and when I have been realizing where people went and so on, I have realized that they were in in people's houses, in private spaces, and they used the the labo, the, the tipi as a background. They were inside the house in the in the kitchen, and they was filling a studio to to take these photos. So this is from my place there I am at the during the summers and I wanted to to 
make a photo from this <coughs> area to show that they didn't go to an institution to, to make these photos. They went to, uh, to family houses. And that's, that's it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Karina. You're welcome. If you have any questions. Yes? Hello. Comments? Yeah, yes, I do have a question. I, I saw your exhibition yesterday. I yes. really liked it. And um, I was struck by the fact that your description of the relation between the Sami people and the race biologists seemed to be very friendly. Yes. And uh, you had a comment about the race biologists as, uh, as individuals and the system. Yes. Perhaps you would like to comment on that. I mean, we are sort of waiting for you to say something about that as well. Okay. Uh, when I started this, I thought I, in the begin in the beginning, I thought because we are, we Sammy, we haven't been talking so much about race biology, and uh, in the beginning, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking it was it was really painful and so on, and uh, that also that they have been forced. And I was, I was also looking for this laughter for a uh, mood stomp. Resistance. Resistance. And um, then I realized that they, um, they had been friends to the boss of the uh, Harman Lumber. He was, he had, uh, uh, he was, this actually, Godfather. Godfather to a child, and uh, people wrote to him because they wanted to have medicine. They were sick and they needed uh, pills for whatever, and. Uh, they wanted to, he had a small house up in the mountains, like this one, and it was a family who wanted to buy it from him. So they were really friends. And uh, I have been really angry with, and it was so easy to be angry at uh, uh, Harman Lundborg. I have been, I did this map with all his connections. And um, I realized, then I met uh, Maya Hagerman. She has written a book about Harman Lundborg and we were talking about, uh, we had lunch to get together during four hours and we were talking. And when I was talking to her, I, re I realized it's not my responsibility to tell the story about the institute. I'm going to tell the story how it was to be um, on the ship. Mm -hmm. Studied. Studied. And I also realized that I wanted to be a subject and not an object in, in this material. So I wanted to take the history back. And I also realized that it was so easy to be angry with a person instead of the system. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also, I'm so happy that I, I met Maya Hagerman because I, then I could really leave I, the anger and just to focus on my own feelings and what and what was making me so upset and 
when I wasn't so angry and anymore, then it was more sadness and shame. I don't know the your question anymore. <laughs> no, 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 well, thank you. Okay. I, was sort of, I was sort of looking for that reflection. Yes. But, and, I, and I also think from, from a sort of an epistemological point of view, I mean, your approach here, you, you are uh, looking into uh, a detailed story and you are telling the story from the perspective of certain people. Hmm. And you also include this, uh, this woman, uh, the race biologist with a skirt. Yes. Uh, what's her name? Anna Michelle. Yeah. And I mean, you, t you tell all these stories, and um, uh, I don't really know how to frame this question. But like, what 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 do you uh, what kind of knowledge do you think uh, do you, do you um, would you say that you get from this approach that you wouldn't get from another approach? That was a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask? Can I ask what what do you mean? What approach would the well, other one be? I mean, a, a, another approach would be to go to the archives and to tell what you find in the archives, and mm -hmm. be the, like the more sort of uh, traditional uh, epistemic uh, way of doing it. This is sort of an artwork. Mm -hmm. Working with the means of uh, an artist, sort of ta taking the photos, not mm -hmm. reproducing them, but reproducing them in your own way. Yes. And uh, also sort of incorporating them in your own practice, mm -hmm. which would be, uh, uh, which would add something, I think. And not just sort of descriptive, but also the practical thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I wanted to hear your reflections on that. What, what would you Can I ask, say something here? Because we've been doing this conversation for some time and doing applications together. And I've been saying, you have to read uh, Linda Tuvai Smith, <laughs> because what you're doing is actually described in a lot of indigenous uh, uh, scholars' work. So I would say what you're doing is actually the part of, I mean, it's very, I would say it's, if it wasn't for the personal pain, it would be easy. It would be easy for someone else who is not touched by this history to go and sit at the, the find things in the archives. But that's just, that's the, that's the distance, uh, dis, uh, deta detached history writing of the, the awful things that happened. But what is important, uh, Linda Tuvai Smith, she wrote uh, a book of methodologies, indigenous methodologies, where one very important one is healing so you know this happened already. So what do I do with it? <laughs> what, uh, so I, th I think if I can interpret your work, what you have been doing, what I, I see it is, is the healing part. You take what has happened and like look at it and uh, bring out how can I relate to it. And that's why I also feel when I, I cannot go to a, a, the, uh, if I, I see this announcement for uh, a, an academic seminar on racial biology where they will talk about the pictures or the bodies because we have bodies, we have Sami bodies in, in here in Uppsala University still in boxes despite that the Sami parliament has demanded them to be re buried. Um, so for me to attend such a seminar without knowing that the person understand what I feel and it's, I can't go there. So to uh, Katarina, I can talk to because she knows and she's been working with it and providing this healing. So I think that's a galaxies apart of understanding the material. Well, I don't like the word material, understanding what has happened. But um, I haven't used so many pictures from the archive because I was thinking that if I'm showing a lot of pictures of it, because it would have been really easy for me to do a really emotional, heavy thing with all these black and white colored pictures and so on, and I could have been doing them really big and so on. But I, I have been thinking in this direction too, and how to do it, but then I realized that I can't ask these people if they want it. And to do it again is going to 
reproduce the arrogant fat. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to do it, and I haven't used the picture of the race biologists either. I have been drawing them on small, uh, because I was also thinking that I can't do it because I can't ask them if they wanted to be in my exhibition. And then to have, uh, and I also felt that the revenge, Hemda, mm -hmm. I was not going to use it because it was not really me. No. So I have decided to not to use all pictures. I have only used this one of Pastor Anna, and I have made a frame to her because I'm so thankful <laughs> because she showed herself in the material. We have a lot of hands up now. I think we first take Lena. Yeah. Uh, I think this uh, hard question, epistemological question, I think for, at least for me, it's very obvious that if I, you allow me to suggest a thing that what the knowledge production you are doing mm -hmm. is really an example of situated knowledges. And so, and you can draw a lot of, of, of things uh, there. For instance, uh, it, it was very hard also to hear that uh, you gave the answer of why didn't you why didn't you get questions uh, answers of why they did it? Mm -hmm. No, it was the language question. Yes, and I mean, to be situated, then you get this kind of, of knowledge up. So, it's an example for for your project of situated knowledge is here, is uh, as I see it. And maybe how situatedness can be productive sometimes. I mean, exactly. our point in line with Donna Haraway is that all knowledge is situated, of course. But if you make that uh, make yourself aware of that as in your in your research process. You can actually use it productively to tell it another story which is also true or has another kind of truth. And you have to tell it from within. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what you Okay, I think we have, uh, was it Anna Karin? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, Anni? Yes, I, um, I was thinking about the this um, that a lot of the peop the relation between the race biologists and the, and the Sami people could be quite friendly, and I mean they were gingerbread and and skirts and <laughs> sort of normal thing. But I was also thinking, but on the other hand, there seem to be people you have met you don't know really why that they they don't seem to want to talk about this that it's something that it's something shameful that they are they are victims. Oh, it's. Uh, but I wonder is, because there was something, I mean, something happened which really changed the, 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 the reason that the race biology, the Institute of Race Biology was shut down was, of course, the Nazis and the, what happened there. And, yeah, actually, I have a personal from, uh, sort of family history from the other side where my mother started working at what was the Institute then for medical genetics in the same house and the same sort of, I mean, the, the same place, the same uh, research, not really the same research, but the, the uh, um, what followed on the race biologist uh, uh, in the sixties, and she, she remember. I mean, there were things like um, on the coat hangers that still said Institute for Race Biology <laughs> and things like that, but no one really reflected on this. And then one day she found in a in a sort of closet in the basement parts of these archives which were still there and the pictures and she, it was really visceral reaction from her it was it was horrible because when she saw these pictures she thought the Nazis were sort of and sort of we we were part of it sort of place I'm working in we were we were responsible sort of she was part of being responsible for for what the terrible things that happened and it was really sort of an eye-opener she hadn't really reflected on this before. Uh, but I mean, that was uh, at that point in the 60s, all this, just seeing this sort of picture would directly, you would directly think of the, the uh, concentration camps of, of yeah. people being, being killed, yeah. uh, which was, of course, not <laughs> the reaction you had before that happened. So I'm, I think 
So that's, have you, have you reflected on that and how the, the experience of, of, I mean, all of the people you, um, you've uh, encountered here has that, has that you see, view, the, re the memory of these things must have changed a lot after all those things, how it was. Yes, I think so too. Mm. It is. And um, I would like to continue and I would like to ask the families that I know had a lot of contact with Herman Lomborg how they are thinking today and to follow mm. their history to and we know what happened during the mm. Second World War and uh, I have been thinking uh, Liksom, kan det vara en kränkning i efterhand? Liksom, mm. så här, because we know the history. Mm. Mm. Yes, I was thinking about this question about why did they, did they, they not say anything? Uh, you can also think that probably in some cases so they could have said something because somebody could understand sign the language and so forth. But the, uh, my harder one is, is thinking about it in, in her book, Sarah uh, mm -hmm. and And she's writing about this, uh, that, uh, uh, I, don't, I do not remember if she's uh, uh, using the word, which is, I think, is very central here. And, and it, is, it is power relations. Mm -hmm. It is power relations, mm -hmm. I think, uh, because uh, what Hagerman is saying like this, that because uh, Her Herman Lundqvist and, and his assistant, they were, he was a professor from Uppsala University. He was a doctor, medical doctor and professor. And ultimately she was, he was representing the Swedish government and Swedish state. Because this uh, Institute of Great Geology also was uh, it's, uh, legitimized as, as uh, science by Swedish government. So ultimately he was representing, representing the Swedish state. So I mean, we can. Uh, for me, it's it's. Uh, I I think it's 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 impossible to think about this question without uh, taking in consideration this question of power relationship. And and then <coughs> when it comes to this speech act, so as you know, so so uh, a discursive discursive power uh, act like this of. All of us are not allowed. All of us, uh, I mean, because the species speech situation is, is not, uh, it is bound to power relations. Uh, and um, it is also uh, obvious what you can say, what can you ask about, how can you ask about, who, who, who is in charge when it comes to the question. So uh, uh, I, I think there are different levels when it comes to also this <coughs> question of, of uh, sociology of languages or sociology of speech. Uh, it's one question. And the other one is this <coughs> question about uh, this social meeting also and, and the position and power relationship and, and so forth. So I think we have got many levels uh, how you can deal with the question, why didn't they do Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Um. Mm? Yeah. Thank you very much. I was very moved by your lecture, actually, and uh, I think it is a wonderful work. And I was, I was thinking, you started with this empty room, yes. and now you've got this, and you sort of, you went to the archives. I, I myself, uh, I'm working with the questions of archives as, as situated, as creating situated knowledge together with Annie mm -hmm. uh, and two other scholars here at the university. And, and we sort of discuss this <laughs> constantly, <laughs> actually. And I was thinking, you, you went to the archives and you decided, no, I'm not going to take these photographs. Other artists have taken photographs from the archives and given them back to the ones who were, uh, who were uh, at the pictures. Mm -hmm. That would be one project, yes. possible project. 
and this in this case it would be a very problematic way to go of course mm -hmm. but I was thinking you were not only influenced by the archives and we are influenced by your story but you also influenced the archives mm -hmm. you know what I mean you, could you comment on that because I think it's a it's a sort how should we deal with these archives how, how the people working there how do they receive and, and go in response towards your project for instance and how could we think one step further? Uh, I was thinking about Anzati's comment of how this could be produ productive to, to regard. It's a sort of dim question yes. in there, but <laughs> yes. perhaps you have some uh, I can tell you the first time I came to, to Kart and Bild and Hetan, and when I wrote my name, and you know you have to, you have this, application or what I don't it's not application but it's a paper that you have to write what you are doing and so on and when I wrote Konstnar artist I felt something happened with the woman and uh, in the beginning the the people who worked at the archive I think they were a little bit afraid what I could do with this uh, photos and um, now I have two albums at the museum and uh, Tula Aufbjör, she has helped me, but uh, she was writing me some mails, what are you going to do with them and <laughs> how and so on. And I realized now they are uh, nervous what I'm going to do with them. And. Um, so I have done one envelope of wool. Uh, it's dark blue, and I have done this tendruderi on one piece. And the other one, I have a belt. A belt. A belt, a woven belt that Elsa on the picture, she was wearing this uh, belt when she, uh, when she was measured and so on. Uh, and I have closed the album with this one and they were a little bit I think they had been discussing this I know it and uh, when the man came with these two albums to the museum for me it was really strong and uh, it was a reporter there and she didn't understand what was happening but that's a different <laughs> story and uh, it was a little bit, it was nice to close these albums, but it's really hard to know how to deal with the material in the archive. Um, and I don't have a good answer how to do with them. Because some, I know that um, the, I have, it's, uh, it's always like, this inside me when I'm there looking at the pictures because I know uh, when they were taken and uh, but then I'm really interesting in traditional costume it's my hobby to sue and I'm looking because uh, the the photos they are really a lot of details and you can see them very well because they are taken by a big store for Mods Commer, I don't know the English name, but the negatives were really big and you can see all the details and if you are interested in costumes, this is a really good material to study the costumes. And then in the other hand they were taken uh, by the race biologists and everything in this so it's like, I don't know how to deal with them. So, um, I don't know. Difficult question. So, uh, Can I please comment on that? Names. Yeah, sure, okay, and then we'll finish with Annie. Yeah. Is that I, okay? Uh, hmm? okay. Yeah. No, I think it's really important to, to because we, a year ago I organized a major event 
regarding racial biology and Uppsala and Katarina was here and Maya Hageman and also Sami organizations, representatives and Sami individuals. And so we, the first day we went to visit the photos uh, and discussed it. And the second day we have a, 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 we have a full day of, of presentations with uh, both Katarina and Maya and, and people from Sami organizations. And the third day we have discussions uh, again about uh, with a smaller group of Sami organizations, people, how to deal with all of this. And what I would say is there are the, the things that you talk about is coming up from Sami people, organizations, but there is both this uh, like what to do the, with them and also the, the happiness of meeting your ancestors, your, your family. But the thing is today Uppsala University has not consulted Sami organizations, Sami parliament, Sami individuals at all. So I see this as the major problem. Uppsala University has a major task challenge here to do the consultation. There's even an ethical protocol made for the Sami human remains, or all human remains, but it, that includes Sami human remains, made by Uppsala University without consulting at all people who are, like, whose relatives are in, in the boxes. And that's a major problem, I think. And, and, and asking, uh, sometimes I get the question, what I think, and I said, I cannot speak for everybody else. We have to have a major discussion consultation with Sami parliament, Sami associations, the relatives concerned. That's what I think. And that's the task of Uppsala University and the Swedish state to deal with this. And the work of Katarina is, is so great because it, I, for me, I said, I cannot go, even go to a seminar when I, because I don't know how they're going to talk about it. But I can, I, can, I can organize a seminar where Katarina is presenting because I know I will not be the one the only one feeling really bad and like wanting to throw up and cry. Mm. So <laughs> you have to start in that from that point of departure. Should we give the last question to Annie? Then we can see. Honor, because my my question um, uh, is connected to your your point too. I was discussing the other day with uh, Cecilia Rodian at the uh, Center for. Um, uh, gender research and she was um, uh, she's working with the cultural heritage of the university uh, and we're discussing how the human remains are now these collections are closed for all, all research you, you can you cannot access them but all the pictures of, of naked people they, they are still as you said they are under the even if the librarians the archivists at the university they didn't want to to uh, give these pictures to, to you, but then they realized it was under the, the act, Freedom of Information Act. So all these things are actually open to anyone to public, mm -hmm. to, public uh, to, to, um, to make, can be made public uh, in any way you want. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's definitely an ethical uh, problem, which is hard to, to come I mean, to pass by because of these laws of the, the archives of the university, and uh, but that's definitely something that should be should be discussed. And how how should you? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a brief comment. Is it really true that you can actually publicize the material, or yeah. you, you you can just have access to it? Isn't that if it's uh, if it's under the uh, information freedom of information act? You but I mean, if you would have published that photo that you got out of there, then, then you wouldn't have the right to do that, would you? I mean, you can have it as a, a person know. for a project. I think you can publish it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't think you can, you can deny you that if it's under the if it's under the the um, uh, freedom of information act. They don't. I mean, it's, it's part of the yeah. university archive. Yeah. The university archive is a is a state institution, and all state institutions, institutions have I mean, their archives should be open. It was like that in the 18th century. <laughs> 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 I'm an 18th century scholar, so that, oh, okay. but I, I'm pretty sure it's still. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Let's go. On. this to be a, a 
a bit of a mind-blowing presentation. Thank you so much. And a very good uh, kickoff for our project, wasn't it? We really got into the difficult questions at once. Uh, I love it. Now, uh, I would like to invite you all to stay, if you like, for we have uh, wine and uh, some uh, vegan uh, things and vegetarian things and shrimp. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, all of you, and I hope Thank to you. see see you again at our yeah, upcoming events. Thank <laughs> you.